The children are having children. They're marrying younger and younger, 14 or 15. Their parents are not saying no. Their country is not saying no. This is China. Especially rural areas, they are welcoming kids. And for the past many years, like、mm-hmm. they don't have enough kids. A young man is dying. He's a coal miner and poor. His wife and two daughters are desperate to get him treatment they cannot afford. What can they do? One of their little girls is ready to sacrifice herself. She's just six years old. This is also China. How desperate a family can be to actually sell a daughter. At first, I don't think they love their kids.、Mm-hmm. I just can't think of any reason for anyone to consider selling their kid. That is Mui Xiao, the only child in her family. Mui became a photojournalist after stumbling on her passion as a storyteller. She takes us deep inside her country with a camera. I'm Mabel Chan, and this is One in a Billion, a podcast about China through the voices of Chinese millennials in America. 1.4 billion people live in China. That's more than four times the population in the United States, and about one fifth of the world's humanity. But China is an aging country. While the Chinese government finally ended three decades of their one-child policy, many traditional families' preference of boys over girls have led to a lopsided society: gender imbalance. Single men and women are under a lot of pressure to find a match, get married, and make babies. Last summer, Muyi spent 18 days in 10 villages within China's Hunan province, documenting a surprising and growing phenomenon. There are many single men in villages, like people call them naked stick. They told me like if they can't get married before twenty, they are mostly likely to become a single man for their whole life. Naked sticks sound bad, right? How about another label, leftover women? That started as a slogan by the government urging young women to get married before twenty-seven. And then another surprising phenomenon is popping up. If the family has a teenage in home. Let's say older than thirteen years old, they're most likely either in relationship or getting married or having baby. It's a common thing for them to start to date while they are in primary school,、What? like ten year old or something. Mu Yi was talking about Mengla, a remote village in Yunnan province. There, she found love letters from a teenage boy to a teenage girl. One of them reads, "Hi, do you have a boyfriend? Hi." Do you have a boyfriend? Can you accept me? Can you accept me? I like you. I like you. Please accept me. Please reply. Parents don't talk to them about it, and especially in that area, getting married at a young age is such a normal thing. So there's no one say no to it.、Right. So people just do it. Mu Yi Xiao first caught my eye with her photo essay of teenage brides in China. What struck me were the faces of these 13 or 14-year-old girls. They're married and they're pregnant. They're looking blissfully happy and playful with their husbands, who are also teenagers. They're not hoping to get pregnant, but the problem is they don't have any birth control. They don't use condoms. They don't take pills. In China. Early marriage is common in many villages, even though the legal age to marry for women is 20 and 22 for men. People in big cities, however, have a different set of priorities. After graduate, you can go to college and、mm-hmm. you can get trained. You know, start your career, and then you start to think about family. Mu Yi Xiao grew up playing alongside the Yangtze River in Wuhan, a large city in central China. She wasn't obsessed with being a good girl. Sometimes I don't do homework. Sometimes I skip classes. I understand your first love was science and math. Oh, <laughs> you thought you'd work in computer coding and programming, and what happened? That I failed in college entrance examinations happened. <laughs> Instead of giving up, Mugi chose a different path. She went to Beijing Language and Culture University, focusing on what intrigued her. I organized on like singing competitions, like everything not related to study.、Mm. I really liked working with stages, you know, and、mm. audience. Okay, so what I can do? Oh, maybe film. Did she go to film school? Well, sort of. So I just sneaked in because my friends is there. I just asked all the schedule of the classes、mm-hmm. and where the classroom is.、Mm-hmm. I just go there. I just I went、see. there. Mui was being coy. She finished her training at the prestigious Beijing Film Academy in China. That's the time I realized I really like stories. 
And that's how I see Mui's own story. She's enterprising. She moves into the unknown. She cuts her own path around and through barriers. Here's how she began her career. I was just like checking, you know, job opportunities online, and I saw this Reuters photo editor.、Mm. It seems like okay, visual journalism, great. <laughs> I'm going for that. Wow! And it's Reuters. Reuters hadn't responded to her resume because they were only interested in candidates from top universities with a journalism degree and excellent English skills, none of which Muyi had. But she kept improving herself and pushing for attention. I did some online research for a specific person. It sounds like stalking, but no. <laughs> I just tracked down the current editor intern there, and I said, "Okay, so can you just give me email of the person whoever is in charge of this?" And he said, "Okay," and he gave me the personal email of that person, not working email. So I sent an email to that person, and the person is so surprised that how can I get his personal email? <laughs> in stalking this person, Mui showed she's got the right stuff. She could track down sources, and I start to work. Without payment for half a year, and、mm -hmm. then one intern left, and I just start to get pay. In a nutshell, Mui has turned a no into a maybe. If there's no job, maybe she could be an intern. She was willing, ready, and able to learn and earn the job when it opens up. My family doesn't have a very good、uh, wealth background because of the whole Cultural Revolution stuff. They are that generation; they don't have proper education. They are the ones who didn't got into college, and、mm -hmm. they are assigned jobs in factories. When I was really young, my mom and dad just keep telling me, "We don't have money, we don't have background, we don't have connections. You have to get everything by yourself." Mui understands firsthand what it's like to be poor. She found one family stuck and drowning in a dilemma. They open up to her. They see me as a photographer, a girl with a camera. This girl with a camera reveals a tragic story of a coal miner named Li Mingjin, who's been diagnosed with lung cancer at age 38. Li lives in his hometown village of Sichuan Province. As the only breadwinner in his family of four, a wife and two young daughters, they're too poor to afford cancer treatments in Beijing. They were planning to sell one of their little girls. How desperate a family can be to actually sell a daughter. I first. I don't think they love their kids. You know, like、mm -hmm. I just can't think of any reason for anyone to consider selling their kid. But when Mui met this family, she realized she was wrong. They are really loving parents. But imagine a parents without any income. When I was there with them in their home,、mm -hmm. we are eating the same thing for four days:、uh, just porridge and、mm -hmm. some meat. And the、mm -hmm. meat was like I think left from like New Year or something.、Mm -hmm. When you're a coal miner, where do you turn when you have cancer? It's really easy, especially for labor workers. They、mm. have this kind of deadly disease,、mm. and once they are sick,、uh, the whole family just tear apart. It's a very common thing.、Mm -hmm. uh, we call it poverty caused by disease. Your photos are stunningly beautiful. There is one. Your caption reads: "One day, Si Yao, the six-year-old girl, came to her mom and cried, 'Don't sell me.'" But after a few hours, she came to her mom again and told her, "Mom, you can sell me. I'm the older one. I should be able to take care of myself. Just remember to buy me back when Dad's cured and you have money. That just rips me apart." Yeah, that ripped me apart too. I can't believe that's what. Sad by a six-year-old girl. Yeah. Wow. They're really sweet. Like the two girls are really, really sweet. Both of them are back in school now because of the money that we raised. When Muyi was covering the story, she had already left Reuters for Tencent, a top technology company in China, with a news website. Tencent has a charitable division that allows her to do more. Muyi decided to do fundraising while reporting on a family's dilemma. I followed them for four days,、mm -hmm. and we raised almost twenty-five thousand、mm -hmm. dollar for them. But you know, when you are treating a cancer,、mm -hmm. that's pretty much for one year. Armed with her camera and her fearless approach, Mui has achieved great success. In 2015, she was named a Magnum Fellow, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity that brought her to New York to showcase her portfolio. How do you see the meaning and purpose of your work? I think one very practical meaning is like the dilemma story I did. If I can help a specific person 
and I go just health. You know, it's a very effective way.、Mm-hmm. And on a bigger scale, like I can't say that I can help that much, but just create awareness, tell them stories, leaving them with some space, and let them think. This summer, Mu Yixiao is traveling around America's Midwest and the South before returning to China for a new job at a new media company. Remember, you are unique. We all share a lot in common. I'd love to hear your story ideas or comments for our podcast. Just go to our website at ChinaPersonified.com. One in a billion is produced by Mitch Hanley and Robin Lowry. I'm Mabel Chan. One in a billion is listening to China, one person at a time.